Good afternoon, everyone. I don't have any opening comments, and I don't see Mr. Lee here. So, Sean, I think you're up. I won't imitate him. Uh, um, I'd like to see that, actually. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe, maybe not on camera. I don't think you would like that. Um, maybe start with the situation in Lebanon. Um, uh, a few things there. First of all, there are evacuation orders that the Israelis, order, uh, Israelis publicly announced today for Wolbeck, a historic city in the, the east. Um, wanted to get your sense about that, whether the U.S. is okay with, with what's happening there and then some other aspects of Lebanon. So ask. we support their right to go after legitimate uh, Hezbollah targets, but in doing so, it is critical that uh, they do so in a way that does not threaten the lives of civilians. Uh, that's especially true in densely populated areas uh, like Bobek. Um, uh, it's important that they not threaten the lives of journalists, UN peacekeepers, members of the Lebanese armed forces. And it's also critical that civilian infrastructure and significant cultural heritage sites be protected. Uh, I'll continue with that. I mean, do you think this is, this is the case with that? I mean, saying that there's a mass evacuation order. I mean, is that is that sort of a, a more targeted strike? I mean, is there any concern that Particularly after we've seen in Gaza that there could be uh, further destruction. So uh, a few things. First of all, we have made clear that uh, the campaign they're conducting in Lebanon should not, cannot, must not look like the campaign that they have conducted in Gaza, and that we should do not want to see that type of widespread damage. In terms of what the operation they're going to conduct, I don't know what it's going to be. I refer you to them uh, to talk to that. But of course, when you are conducting a military operation in an area where civilians are operating, and we know that Hezbollah does embed itself among civilian targets, you want to actually see civilians evacuate. That's something our military advises, something the militaries advise around the world, that before you conduct a strike in a densely populated civilian area, a best practice is to uh, urge that civilians evacuate the area so the military operation can be conducted, and then when it's concluded, civilians can return. Let me ask you about the diplomatic aspects of that. Um, there's a new leader of Hezbollah who said today that, I mean, essentially they're they're open to, I mean, within many conditions, I'm sure, but they're open to, in general to negotiating some sort of ceasefire. Uh, it seems that the Israeli cabinet was meeting uh, last night on this. Uh, where do things stand? I mean, does the U.S. in particular have, have an idea for how this can uh, can, can come to an end, and is the U.S. at this point calling for, for a ceasefire? Uh, we do ultimately want to see, uh, see a ceasefire, and we want to see a diplomatic resolution that, uh, that allows civilians both in Lebanon and Israel return to their homes. Um, two White House officials, Brett McGurk and Amos uh, Hochstein, are traveling to Israel to engage on uh, issues including a diplomatic resolution in Lebanon, as well as how we get to a, um, an end to the conflict in Gaza and other regional matters. And one of the things that they are going to discuss is how we can uh, find a diplomatic resolution that fully implements a UN Security Council Resolution 1701, something that we have not seen over the past few years. You just said that Amos and Brett are going to Israel. I know you're not going to say preview what, what, what exactly the proposals are, but uh, but does this indicate that there's more momentum, and that there's the U.S. has, has more in the has, has believes that there's more of a chance right now of getting to an end? Look, I I, I never want to try and. Um, uh, uh, speculate's not the right word. I'm trying to think when you wager money or I never want to try to, to, to lay odds. I don't, I don't want to lay odds on what the chances are of getting a deal. I can tell you that we've been focused on trying to find a diplomatic resolution. Uh, as you know, the secretary was in uh, Israel and a number of other countries in the region last week. And one of the things that he was working on um, was finding how we can get to not just any diplomatic resolution, but this is really important, one that fully implements 1701 and give civilians on both sides of the border they, the confidence they need to come to their home, to, that they will be able to go back to their homes and stay there, not that they will can go back to their homes. And then a month later or two months later, Hezbollah forces return to areas along the border and start putting civilians in bo on both sides of the border in jeopardy again. That is what we have been working on trying to achieve, and that's what they're going to work on in this trip, and that's what we're going to work on in our other diplomatic engagements. Matt. Uh, I, so, sorry, I was on the phone. I missed it. That's all right. Uh, we, can, so we can come back to you. Yes. Yeah. Um, just to put a point, finer point on Sean's question, Matt, do you guys believe that Israel has gotten to a point in its offensive against Hezbollah that they should accept a diplomatic resolution at this point? Have uh, they achieved their strategic aims, as you guys say, at Nehemiah uh, and Gaza? I am not going to get into private diplomatic conversations. They have made uh, a significant progress in 
striking Hezbollah sites along the border, in clearing out Hezbollah infrastructure uh, along the border, in forcing Hezbollah forces along the border to pull back, um, and we will be engaging with them privately about what we see as the path forward. And do you have any comments on the reports about the contours of this proposal, 60 days ceasefire um, that the U.S. is set to put on the table? I, I don't. I know there are a number of reports out there, but I, I don't want to uh, confirm or, spe or, or comment on them publicly. And then I have more questions on Gaza. I don't know if anyone has more on Lebanon. I just have a few on Lebanon. Um, so on this uh, ceasefire versus diplomatic resolution, the United States is not calling for an immediate ceasefire right now, but would you welcome a ceasefire if one is struck like in a few days? I'm just trying to understand. We want to get to the point where we have a ceasefire and, we, and a diplomatic resolution. We are not calling for one right now. What we are trying to do is structure such a diplomatic resolution with all of the relevant parties. That's the diplomatic work that we okay. have been engaged in. We're not there yet, okay. but we're working to get there. If it takes you another month to get there, is the United States okay with Israel bombing and continuing its ground invasion in Lebanon for another month? I I'm not going to get into hypothetical. We're working on finding a resolution that fully implements 1701. You, United States thinks that Israel has I can't remember the exact word you used, but Israel has made a lot of achievements in terms of degrading Hezbollah in Lebanon. What is Israel telling you in terms of achieving their military objectives? Now, I, am not, I am not going to speak for them. Uh, I will let them speak publicly for themselves and in terms of what they have told us privately. I think it's obviously appropriate that I keep those comments private. Would you, would you say you have agreement with the Israeli government on this, whether or not how long more this uh, military operations should continue? We on? have ongoing conversations with them about what a diplomatic resolution can look like and what it should look like. We have, And those conversations are ongoing. I should point out, not just with the government of Israel, but also with the government of Lebanon. But I'm not going to read those out publicly. Oh, one more thing. Yeah. Um, and I have a bunch of on Gaza, but you can come back to me. When Will this plan um, that you guys are trying to craft on the implementation of 1701 is that going to include an article or an element that will allow Israel to intervene if it felt its security is threatened? I, I think you know what the answer to that question is going to be, which is that I'm not going to answer about what the, a specific diplomatic resolution might look like while we were in the process of negotiating that with the relevant parties. Okay. Well, you know, I got to try. Yeah, I, I, don't, I certainly don't mind. Certainly don't mind you trying. Go ahead. Um, can I shift to uh, a few sure. kilometers away? Sure. Okay. Um, so uh, what is the State Department's assessment of China's silence and lack of direct com commentary on North Korea sending troops to Russia? Uh, I'm not going to comment on what they have or have not said about that matter. Uh, I will note that it is a matter of significant concern for us that North Korea has deployed troops to Russia. Uh, and that those troops in Russia are currently receiving training and that we believe it's possible they may end up deploying um, to Kursk to, um, uh, to engage in combat. Um, what I will say is that we have engaged directly with officials with the government of China to make quite clear our concerns about this deepening military relationship between Russia and North Korea, and to make clear that we think this ought to be a source of concern for China as well as other countries in the region. But as to their reaction, I will let them speak for themselves. And this communication, was it done through PRC embassy here in Washington? I'm not going to speak to the, the nature of the communication, but I will tell you we have had very robust conversations with the government of China about this matter. And last one, uh, does the State Department share the assessment that North Korea is prepared to conduct nuclear or missile tests before or after the U.S. presidential election? No, I don't have any comment on that at all. We rarely uh, comment on that type of thing from, from the podium. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, do you think this deployment of North Korean troops in Russia further complicates the situation for NATO allies, not only for U.S., given in Zelensky's, President Zelensky's victory plan, including being a NATO member now, do you think it further complicates all things? Or, for example, allowing Ukraine to use 
uh, NATO allies supplied weapons to use those weapons on North Korean forces, for example, if they end up in Kursk or something. Uh, I don't think it. I'm sorry. Situation. I don't think it complicates the issue at all, but I think it raises certainly concerns uh, among some a number of our NATO allies. We've heard that directly in our conversations with NATO allies that they're every bit as concerned about this development as we are, and so it. In terms of what the response will look like, that is something we're consulting with them on right now. Uh, the South Korean uh, foreign minister and the South Korean defense minister, another uh, important ally of ours, will be in town tomorrow to meet with Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin. I can uh, guarantee you that this development will be a significant uh, topic of discussion in those meetings as well. So if those troops would be ending up in the fronts, like in Kursk, for example, will Ukraine be allowed to use weapons provided by U.S. and NATO allies? I'm just not going to get into a hypothetical. I'm not going to get into a hypothetical. Sorry. Thank you, Matt. I'm struck by uh, your response to Sean on, you know, uh, you said that you don't want to see the widespread damage that you've seen. But, but in Gaza, it's total destruction. So anything short of that total destruction would be acceptable? You don't want to see something similar? Said, we want to see a diplomatic resolution. I'm well, trying to well, understand well, your Said, let me, if you're going to ask a question, yeah, you, sure. you uh, deserve to let me respond to the question. We want to see this conflict uh, uh, resolved through a diplomatic uh, resolution that allows people to return to their homes and borders well short of any kind of prolonged campaign like we've seen in Gaza. Right. right. Uh, now, you know, uh, Israel is striking in, in, in the Bekaa Valley, it's, it's eastern Lebanon and so on. And, and so you said that they have the right to go after legitimate Hezbollah targets and so on. But really, Israel can say there is a Hezbollah target there. No, nobody is vetting. Nobody is looking, uh, you know, saying, they can determine really whether this was a legitimate Hezbollah target. Correct? You they, say it that way? So there are, so say, I don't think it is disputed. Okay. Maybe you'll dispute it. But I don't think it is a matter of dispute that... There are Hezbollah operatives basically deployed in a number of occasions across Lebanon. We talk a lot about southern Lebanon because we see them concentrated there for in large reason because um, uh, it's where they can most readily and easily threaten uh, Israeli troops and Israeli villages and Israeli right. civilians. But that's not the only place that they are around Lebanon. Right. And we've seen Isra Israel striking uh, Hezbollah targets in other places around Lebanon. No, I, I understand. I'm saying, of course, Hezbollah is probably all over the country. What I'm saying is with that, uh, Israel does not have to verify that this was, you know, X person Hezbollah or that person Hezbollah, do they? Uh, verify to whom, Said? Verify to the world. I mean, you know, you, you, keep, you keep saying that this is a legitimate. How do we know it's legitimate? So we have How seen a number know? of examples of, uh, you can see for yourself, video of... <laughs> Hezbollah rockets mm -hmm. that are pulled out of civilian homes, Hezbollah rockets and arms cache is and other significant military equipment hidden inside civilian homes, hidden under civilian homes. So with respect to each strike, it's always difficult to say what's happening with each target, but there's ample evidence, Saeed, of them uh, hiding their troops, hiding their equipment, hiding their arsenals inside civilian homes. Okay, you know, one more on Lebanon. So you're saying that you, for now, you're not calling for a ceasefire. Are, are there any talks underway of any kind that maybe can achieve a ceasefire that is delinked from Gaza? And we have always thought that it should be delinked from Gaza. That has been the position of the United States right. uh, since Hezbollah started rockets, firing rockets uh, on October over 8th, mm -hmm. that the, the that Hezbollah was putting people's lives in danger um, by linking these two conflicts when they didn't need to be linked. Now, um, you've seen some public indications from Hezbollah that they no longer take that position. We're in talks about how to reach a diplomatic resolution, and we'll see how they turn out. Uh, now, uh, on Gaza, the Kamal Adwan Hospital was completely overwhelmed after Israel's you know, massacre in Beit Lahia. Is the United States doing any, could, could you do any kind of, uh, could you take any steps that uh, to alleviate the situation that can address this urgent condition in this particular case, uh, the, the Kamal Adwan Hospital. So I'll say that we have raised this issue with the government of Israel. We've asked that they uh, explain what has happened here, not only to us, but that they explain it publicly. I think it's important that they do that. Um, uh, I will let them speak to exactly what they're doing. But I will say with regards to what happens immediately, we continue to make clear that 
food, water, and medicine need to make it into all areas of northern Gaza, including areas where Israel is currently conducting military operations. But then long term, the way that you fully address this problem is to find an end to the war in Gaza, which is what we're trying to do. Okay, so on that point, uh, do you have any update on you know, the future of the talks? So the, negotiator, the negotiators met in recent days, as I think you know, Saeed, we've talked about right. that publicly. Um, we're continuing to talk about what a possible way forward uh, will be, looking at both the, the proposal that we put on the table several months ago that was endorsed by the United Nations Security Council, that was endorsed by countries around the world, um, as well as other alternatives that might uh, provide for uh, a way forward that would end the conflict and get the hostages home and alleviate the suffering of civilians on the ground in Gaza. But uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk about where those talks stand and, and and uh, the specifics of um, uh, what we're discussing in them. Thank you. Do you want to come back? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So just uh, I'm back on Lebanon. Um, do you have any reason to believe that uh, the Israelis, at least in Baalbek, are going to uh, target significant cultural heritage? Uh, uh, no, I am not speaking. I'm, I'm going to. I'm not going to speak at all for what they may or may not do. They should speak to that. But um, making clear on behalf of the United States that no, of course they should not target significant cultural heritage. Uh, and artifacts. they should also not target civilians. Of course not. And yet, what have you seen in Gaza? And so in southern Lebanon, we have seen them targeting Hamas militants, but at great civilian harm. Um, uh, at great harm to civilian. Now, of course. The situation is different in Hamas and as then in I'm sorry, the situation is different in Gaza than it is in Lebanon, and that in many cases in Gaza it's very difficult to find places to move to. It's a much smaller geographic area than Lebanon. Um, uh, so uh, we're hopeful that what can happen is that people can evacuate. Israel can conduct whatever military operations they're conducting against legitimate, Hezbollah targets, and then the people can return to their homes afterwards. Well, do you agree with what uh, you know, U.S. officials said, you know, even as early as last year that the, the civilian death toll, and this is referring to Gaza, was far too high, far too many yes. civilians. Have died. And do you, do you agree that that's the same in Lebanon? Uh, we don't want to see any civilians killed. Oh, yes, know, there have there have been there have been civilians that have been killed in Lebanon, and, and um, no, we, yes, the, dole, the when the the toll when there are any civilians killed, that is too high a toll, which is why we want to see a resolution and end of the conflict. Okay, and then yesterday you said that you had asked uh, the Israelis for maybe someone else had asked this already. No, um, for a, an explanation of what happened in northern Gaza with this building that was apparently blown up. Yeah, we reiterated that call with them today. We do not yet have an explanation. They have said to us what they have said publicly, which is they're investigating the matter, and we are pressing them for an answer. Okay. Well, it just seems like it, that it, every day that goes by, and I know this is something that comes up every day in the briefing, that every day that goes by, there's yet another incident like this um, that you guys have questions about or concerns about. You called it horrifying yesterday from from yeah. the podium um and yet they they continue to happen and so i i'm just wondering <laughs> what is it going to take for you guys to make a determination that this kind of thing uh, is a violation of uh, of international law so i will make clear as we've said before they are not doing enough to get us the answers that we have requested. And you saw the secretary raise this in a letter that he sent uh, a little over two weeks ago and said that they need to do more to set up a channel so when we have answers to these types of questions that they provide us with those answers. They also need to provide the public with answers to these questions. There are uh, significant questions that you all ask that other uh, countries have asked that we believe <laughs> Israel needs to answer publicly. Um, I can't tell you where this is gonna go. I can tell you that we are not just pressing them for answers, but also conducting our own reviews based on information that we are gathering independent of the government of Israel. And we will make those uh, determinations when we've completed those reviews, but I can't put a timetable on it. Uh, okay, and then um, in terms of the, uh, the, the letter that you just uh, mentioned, um, the, the aid, the humanitarian aid, the amount of hum humanitarian aid that's getting into Gaza now, you talked about how there's been a small improvement, some border crossings reopened, a few more trucks getting in, uh, and yet the, the need seems to be just 
far, far greater than, yeah. than what is getting in. And so where, where, what's this, do you have any kind of a status update on, on are they making more progress toward meeting the, the requirements that you laid out, that were, that were laid out in the letter, or there, is it still the same? It is still roughly the same. There have been little improvements here and there on things like additional routes opening up inside Gaza and work around um, trying to, to work through some of the security issues. Um, but the situation still remains um, not at a level that we find acceptable. And that's not just about the level of, uh, tr of aid that is making it to Gaza, but also the distribution inside Gaza. And we continue to see um, breakdowns in communication between uh, Israeli forces and UN agencies that is important to be to ensuring that aid can be delivered safely. Um, uh, sometimes UN agencies not getting the permits that they need, or the, I should say the permissions, not permits, but permissions that they need to travel um, around Gaza, sometimes getting permissions granted and then uh, yanked, or it doesn't get communicated down to the uh, officer who's at a, a particular checkpoint. That needs to change. Um, and so the aid, much of the aid that's getting to Karim Shalom or Erez, then isn't, it ma isn't making its way to people either because of these bureaucratic uh, obstacles or because it's being looted uh, in many cases by armed gangs that are operating inside Gaza due to the breakdown in the security situation. So um, uh, it, it continues to be of great concern to us and we have not seen sufficient improvement since the secretary sent that letter. Okay, and then just getting into the weeds of, uh, weeds of that letter, there's, can you explain the difference between the 30 day deadline that secretaries Austin and Blinken um, laid out for the Israelis and the legislation that the Knesset passed the other day um, on uh, basically banning UNRWA, <coughs> which would take effect in 90 days unless there's some kind of a, a, yeah. a delay in that. It does the 30-day the deadline, my understanding, still for your for the requirements laid out in the letter still remains. Is that the 30 day right? deadline does still remain. If you just look at the way the letter is structured, the letter makes clear that there are a number of improvements to the delivery of humanitarian assistance that we want to see happen, some immediately, some by the end of that 30 day period. And it goes through the a number of specific improvements that we want to see them take. It then in a, a different section of the letter says relatedly, and it raises the issue related to passage of this UNRWA legislation, which of course had not passed um, uh, when uh, when the secretary sent the letter, and then a couple of other issues as well. So those are not those were not issues that were related to the 30 days outlined in the letter, um, but nevertheless are issues that we take seriously, and that's why the letter made clear with respect to this. Uh, the passage of this legislation that uh, it could have implementations under U.S. law and policy in the same way that Put failure it. to Im impl failure, yeah, implications under U.S. law and policy in in the, the same way that failure to improve the delivery of humanitarian assistance could have implications under U.S. law but, and policy. But, you don't, but at the moment, you don't think that uh, the legislation is going uh, will affect um, Israel's ability to meet the 30 day the the legislation is really a separate question than under the 30 days so no i, I know but, it has its but own it's, it has its own implications but no the 30 days review that we are conducting relates to those first sections of the letter which now, rely on UNRWA, but which very much rely on but under this legislation if it is implemented wouldn't be implemented until 90 days from yesterday or right whatever the but i guess signed. i mean I, I, and so people are a little bit including me, are a little bit confused as to, you know, if you have this impending implementation of a ban on what you say is the biggest and most effective organization that's distributing aid into Gaza, even if it hasn't yet gone into effect, um, there are going to be implications or, you know, most likely going to be implications for what happens even before that 90 day period runs out. For sure. Is that, is that not correct? Um, there could be, but there may not be, right? The law could be stayed. Uh, but I, but what maybe the way to think about it, Matt, is while we raise things that we wanted to see change over the next 30 days, it's not like if Israel implemented every one of those things at the end, and at the end of the 30 days, we saw a significant improvement that we just stop assessing these on an ongoing basis. We don't. So the 30 days is related to these things that we wanted to see happen to change the situation on the ground. But our assessment on all of those things will continue, just as our assessment on the effects of this legislation will continue if and when it is ever implemented. 
Tamara. Matt, just um, on this Washington Post and Reuters story, um, they were first um, about- Who was first? Post was first. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I thought, you, I thought you were saying you were, I was not trying to rub salt, I was, <laughs> I was trying to. <laughs> um, State Department officials have identified nearly 500 potential incidents of civilian harm during Israel's military operations in Gaza involving US furnished weapons, but they have not taken action. None of them moved to stage three. So could you explain how it is that, you know, officials identify 500 separate incidents that do involve unnecessary civilian harm, possibly using U.S. weapons, but none of them makes it to the stage three under Cherub process? So a few things about that. Number one, I think it's always important to reiterate that we have consistently made clear to the government of Israel our serious concerns about this issue and their need to do more to minimize civilian deaths. Um, and it continues to be something that we engage with them on that we make quite clear. Second thing I want to make clear is that, yes, we are reviewing a number of incidents uh, through the CHURG and, and other processes and procedures that we have uh, set up. And I'm not going to get into uh, those ongoing reviews. But um, as you heard us say, these are complicated issues. They're complicated factual issues. They're complicated legal issues. And so um, we have not yet gotten to the point with any of them that we have been able to make final determinations. But there are a number of incidents. And that is part of the issue. We have a number of different incidents that we have to look at just based on the nature of this conflict and the scope uh, and extent of this conflict and the extent of civilian harm. As you heard us say before, you heard us when we um, uh, released the uh, NSM 20 report, if you just look at the overall scope of the damage and the number of civilian lives that have been lost, we do believe it's reasonable to assess there are, there are incidents in which Israel did not meet all of its international humanitarian law obligations. But when it comes to specific incidents, those reviews are still ongoing. But I mean, I'm actually surprised that you unprompted um, flag the NSM 20 report, which exactly, yes, says that. So it's a isn't it a little bit inconceivable that more than a year now, some of these incidents go way back to last October, it's been more than a year, and you guys are still yet to definitively assess that any one single incident violates international humanitarian so law. let me just first say, the reason I flagged the NSM 20 report specifically is because one of the stories to which you referred um, uh, had sourced to officials as if it were uh, a revelation that we believe that there, there very well could be violations of international humanitarian law. When that is something that a report ordered by the president, overseen by the secretary, had concluded several months ago. So we've been quite clear. Uh, we've been quite clear about the fact. And that's why I mentioned. That's why I thought it was important to mention it. Um, but no, the the. When it comes to these determinations, these are incredibly difficult. It takes gathering facts, it takes gathering information, um, and it takes ultimately making legal judgments about those facts. And oftentimes you have conflicting accounts of what happened, and it's our job to try to sort through that the best we can. And it's a very difficult process where we're looking at a number of incidents. Uh, I can tell you, we want to finish that work as soon as possible. We have a number of people working on it, but it's very difficult work. Um, is the, would you say the United States government is committed to investigating any possible misuse of its weapons by any foreign forces, including Israel? Yes, absolutely. But then how do you square that commitment with your inability to find we are be, we are con here? no we are conducting those investigations and we are conducting them thoroughly and we are conducting them aggressively but we want to get to the right answer and it's important that we not jump to a preordained result and that we not skip any of the work that we do all of the important fact finding that we need to do before making what isn't a pretty significant determination and that's what we're doing yeah excuse me mr Murray. uh you have keep saying that uh, you don't need to see any um, like Hamas member in Gaza after this uh, war or not governing this uh, 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 Gaza Strip. But you know that in Gaza there are many many military group or like many Palestinian group uh, like they fighting like not since 7th October. It's like before October 7th. So like the story hasn't started in October 7th. Like there is a United uh, Nations resolution, like that Israel's border is for June uh, 1967. So, and those, they are not like ISIS or Qaeda, they are not global fighters. All of them are Palestinian in this land, like this, they are exist and their ancestors, like since like hundreds of years. So you don't believe that these, like this group, they have a right in West Bank or in Gaza 
to fight for their freedom if Israel doesn't apply the so, resolution of going back to the border of 4 June 1967 because you are insist about 1701 in Lebanon for like civilian so, uh, coming back and stuff. So this first question, like second so, question. Let me, just, let me just answer the first question because I should be very clear. No, we do not accept the idea that terrorism is an ultimate resolution to the dispute uh, over the establishment of a, pal a Palestinian state. We support the creation of an independent Palestinian state. We believe that negotiations between the parties is the way to achieve that. We are pushing to, uh, to find a way to end the war and bring about an independent Palestinian state, but we absolutely do not accept that terrorism is a legitimate way to uh, achieve that outcome. Yes, but like, like so far, like the settlement in West Bank, it has been expanding since Oslo, 1993. And like Palestinian, they don't have army, they don't have anything. Like if Palestinian, like not in Gaza, in West Bank, decided to defend his land, his land by using a weapon against the settlements, they have a legitimate to defend their land it, or they don't the, have? The, the, that is uh, something that law enforcement should address. It is something that the security forces should address. And we will work to, uh, along with our allies, our partners around the world, to make clear that we want to see uh, ultimately a resolution to this issue. We want to see the establishment of an independent Palestinian state. But we do not believe that increased violence is the answer. And certainly, the kind of terrorism that we saw on October 7th, where Hamas fighters came across and uh, killed, murdered, raped women, children, absolutely do not believe that is the answer. And I will tell you, not only is that not the answer for uh, because of the impacts it has on Israeli victims, but just look at what has happened over the past year to the Palestinian people as a result of the terrorism of October 7th. We absolutely reject that course. Okay, last question. Uh, about the, let's follow up for my uh, uh, colleague yesterday about the uh, aid in Gaza. If, if Israel controls everything for like fighting, why they don't control this gang? Like why they let, if they are like, really care about human being and humanitarian uh, assistance, why they control you should, that? It's a question for the government of Israel, you should direct but, to them. We want to see an increase in the, uh, an improvement in the security situation, but when that's, that, is a, that is straight up a question for the government of Israel. <laughs> Go ahead. I have a question from yesterday, Matt, yeah. that Knesset passed a law that would bar the establishment of a consulate for Palestinians in Jerusalem. Do you guys have comment on that? Uh, yeah, we oppose that legislation. Have you discussed this with the Israeli government? Uh, we have made clear to them that we um, oppose the bill. We continue to believe uh, opening a U.S. consulate in Jerusalem would be an important way for our country to engage with and provide support to the Palestinian people. Uh, in the meantime, we have a team in Jerusalem in our Office of Palestinian Affairs that manages our relationship with the Palestinian, author Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian people. And then on Iran, what's the current assessment of whether Iran will respond to Israel's response last week? Uh, I'm not going to offer an assessment as to what they may or may not do, uh, but we believe that they should not respond. We believe that uh, that was an appropriate response by the government of Israel to an unprecedented attack by Iran, uh, but that this should be the end of it. A colleague was told by a source that Iran is planning a, quote, definitive and painful response before the U.S. election. Has this been communicated privately to the United States? Uh, I'm, so I'm not going to talk about communications between our two government, real or imagined. Um, but as we have made clear publicly, and I can tell you that Iran knows this message quite clearly, they should not in any way continue to escalate this conflict. This should be the end of it. And last one, has there been any communication direct or indirect with the Iranians since last week's Israeli response? I'm not going to speak to uh, uh, potential communications, only to say that we do have the ability to communicate to them with it's our interest. Every once in a while I come here and talk about the nature of some of those communications, but I think they know quite clear, clearly uh, what our opinion on this matter is. Can I just follow up quickly yeah. on your response on the consulate? Uh, what's your view on whether on, on the legality and you're on, like legal questions per se, but but it's, it's legislation there saying that the U.S. can establish a consulate. It's, it's a diplomatic facility. Obviously, Israel has this, this control over over land, etc. But can the U.S. does the U.S. have to abide by this? Uh, you're right. It's a legal question that unfortunately I'm unqualified to answer. I don't know the answer. Um, we've opposed it uh, on policy grounds. Well, considering the U.S. government. <clears throat> previous administration actually closed down the consulate. Um, is it your, your, it's your understanding that that was just an, 
that was a, a decision by one administration. It's not binding on you. You want to reopen it. They say no. So if they're not going to let you reopen it, would you consider requiring Israel to shut down <clears throat> one or more of its consulates in, in, in the United States? So first of all, you're right. The, the previous administration made a policy decision not to, to – or sorry, made a policy decision to shut down that embassy. Um, the consulate, excuse me. Um, I'm not going to talk about what our potential response. We are not considering any such step at this time, but we've made quite clear to the government of Israel that we oppose the bill. Well, do you, yes, okay. But do you regard this as some kind of an infringement on your diplomat? I mean, where, where the consulate was, or the building still is, is in Israel. So it's not in the Palestinian in Palestinian territory, um, would you consider opening a consulate, say, in Ramallah for the Palestinians? Uh, I don't want to get into what we may or, or may not consider. We want to Jericho see, we continue to believe it's important to open a consulate, but I don't want to get into what we may or may not do. Well, so the, 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 I, I get, I, you, you oppose the legislation, and yet it is Israel, it, it's their territory. Right. I don't think that the place that the, 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 where the consulate is located is it's not contested. It is in West Jerusalem, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. So it's it, it's theirs and they can tell you what that they want you to have this consulate open there or not. But and, and there may be legitimate reasons for not wanting to have a consulate that is uh, dedicated to serving the Palestinians in Israel, right? Yes? Well, they can so, speak for themselves so what the their reasons is, may or may right. not be. We but, disagree, but, uh, we disagree but, with the, their decision to prevent okay, us but from why, Okay, but why is it so important, other than the historical uh, historical nature of this? The historical thing, nature of it is important. That is, that, yes, that is, that's it, an important, that's an, huge, that is an important, that huge, is an important one. Yes, it but, is, but other, but other than that, is there a reason that a consulate couldn't, for the Palestinians couldn't be open someplace else? Um, I don't want to get into previewing what we may or may not do. I will right. tell you, as of today, we'll continue to provide uh, uh, engagement <laughs> with uh, Palestinians and with the Palestinian Authority through our Office of Palestinian Affairs Hello, in Jerusalem. City. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. A um, couple of questions uh, on Georgia and uh, different topics. So the self-claimed ruling party in Georgia, uh, they uh, seem to have been enjoying, you know, uh, congratulating letters from like-minded. Enjoying what? <laughs> Congratulations, Lairs, from like-minded of Zion leaders, you know, Azerbaijan, Belarus, and others. And they also misunderstood, I mean, I had this, uh, um, help us understand clearly, misunderstood the uh, White House letter from yesterday. They said that the presidential call on Georgian government to transparently investigate all election irregularities is, quote-unquote, uh, significant recognition of what's widely believed to be a rigged election. The, the, the statement from the president meant exactly what the statement from the president meant and nothing else. You mean uh, the president called on, uh, you know. An investigation, the, yes. <clears throat> investigation uh, conducted by whom? Uh, he called for an investigation by Georgian authorities. We've also made clear that we're consulting with our uh, colleagues uh, in the European Union about what other uh, investigations may be appropriate. Well, it appears that they did start some investigation, so-called. They actually are investigating the president who is disputing the results rather than investigating those who are violated. So I'll let the president speak for uh, herself, but my understanding is she has said that she has information about irregularities, um, so hopefully she can provide that information that would be relevant to any investigation, whether it's conducted by Jordan, Georgian authorities or anyone else. Is there anything you can do about it? There are American you know, monitors. We have, have made clear, we have made clear that our relationship with the government of Georgia continues under review. We have already suspended $95 million uh, in assistance to the government of Georgia, and other assistance that we provide remains under review. We have seen an uh, intimidation campaign against, you know, uh, civil society members. You know, two members, even before the election, were targeted. You know, uh, they actually work for American institution, and their bank accounts got frozen. Do you have any reaction? Uh, so, look, we, uh, I'm not going to comment on those specific cases, but obviously we want to see people's fundamental freedoms upheld. We want to see their freedom to protest, their freedom to exercise, uh, their fun fundamental right to expression not infringe uh, upon in any way. I'm going to go back to uh, Ukraine uh, and your responses to my colleagues on uh, increasing. Last Russia. question, Alex, and I'm going to move so, on because I'm running near the end. Increasing Russian time. threat and how you're helping Ukraine you know, to uh, fight back. Uh, President Zelensky today uh, you know, gave an interview and he said that only 10% of 
what was meant to be delivered in 2024, approved by the Congress, has been delivered so far. Why 10% and how do you square that? So I'm not going to speak to, to that percentage. I would defer you to my colleagues at the Pentagon who are in charge of delivering assistance to speak to the exact number that's been delivered. But if you look at the way that we structured the assistance that we have provided and you look at what uh, the way we have just recently approved uh, uh, significant new drawdown authorities, it allows us to deliver assistance to Ukraine in a way that is sustained over time. And for specifics, I'd refer you to my colleagues at the Pentagon. Ryan, go ahead. So I asked yesterday about uh, Pakistan security services yeah. circulating dossiers about American congressmen being under the influence of the, quote, Jewish lobby. Any? Did you get a chance to check that out? Uh, I did look at it, and uh, I saw the, some of the social media postings and some of the stories to which you were, you were referring. Um, I can tell you we don't know who is behind circulating that information ultimately, um, but that if people have issues that they want to engage with regarding U.S. officials, whether they be uh, executive branch officials or officials from the United States Congress, they should engage on the merits of those issues and not by talking about people's religion or sexual orientation. And re real quickly on uh, Marwan Barghouti, uh, he was beaten allegedly by IDF prison guards. Maybe you addressed this on Monday. I don't think I was here uh, that day. Uh, I didn't. Any reaction? Uh, so I will say that we have made clear in a number of, of uh, conversations with officials from the government of Israel that they need to ensure that all detainees are treated humanely, whoever they may be. And those conversations go back uh, over the course of many months. And were there specific conversations about this particular? I don't want to get into specific conversations, but we have made clear when we've had these conversations with them that they pertain to every individual that is in uh, Israeli custody. Go Thank ahead you. and I'll come to you next, Robbie. Thank you. A senior leader of Imran Khan's political party, Latif Khosa, claimed that um, the Imran Khan could be released if uh, Donald Trump elected as a new president. He also said that uh, in, in, if Donald Trump wins, uh, the political landscape can be changed in favor of Imran Khan. He also said that U.S. diplomat Donald Lu was involved in a conspiracy to remove Imran Khan from prime minister office. We know we talked about it like many times. I know. I think I, <laughs> I, I don't know how many times but, I can say but, that, that, but that, that, that that's not true. Dragging, but dragging U.S. president and presidential candidates and uh, American diplomats in Pakistani politics is a good idea? Uh, so look, as we've said uh, many times, um, legal proceedings against the former prime minister are matters for the Pakistani courts to decide. The allegations that the U.S. played any role in his removal from office are false. Uh, we've gone over that any number of times from this podium. Um, and ultimately, Pakistani politics are a matter for the Pakistani people to decide in accordance with their laws and constitution. So the Canadian government has alleged that India's Home Affairs Minister Amit Shah, Prime Minister Modi's close associate, was behind a recent series of uh, plots to murder and intimidate Sikh leaders on Canadian soil. Does the U.S. share this understanding? So the allegations made by the government of Canada, uh, Canada are concerning, and we will continue to consult with the Canadian government about those allegations. Robbie, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Matt. Uh, on the uh, killing of Turkish-American activist Aisha Nurezgi Aegi, it's been 53 days since she was killed by Israel, and there has been no accountability. Uh, can you update us on what is the U.S. doing uh, regarding this, and whether the secretary has raised, raised this? with Israelis last week? Um, so ultimately, this is, a, uh, in the first instance, um, an investigation that's being conducted by the government of Israel. We know they are conducting a criminal investigation into this killing. We have made clear how concerned we are about the fact that she was shot while attending a protest, um, uh, an incident that never should have happened never should have been killed under these circumstances. For her to say that publicly, we have also been quite clear with the government of Israel about that privately. Uh, I can tell you that we have engaged with them uh, in recent days about the status of that investigation. We understand that it is uh, still ongoing and we're continuing to press for a conclusion of that investigation that provides uh, a thorough answer. And as soon as we have an answer from the government of Israel, you will certainly hear from us uh, about what we think about it. And, you know, there are increasing uh, calls for an independent investigation into her killing. I understand that, you know, it is the Justice Department, not the State Department, is responsible uh, for launching an investigation. Uh, but uh, can the State Department at least investigate whether, you know, uh, U.S. supplied weapons uh, were, were used in in her killing? So I, I think as a matter of 
first principle, it's important that the criminal investigation that's ongoing right now proceed. Um, in no way does waiting for the outcome of this ongoing criminal investigation preclude any action by the U.S. government if we think such action is appropriate. And that includes uh, further reviews uh, on behalf, uh, by the State Department into the use of weapons. It, include, it, it includes any other types of reviews by our government or, or by any other. So uh, all that is to say, um, we are as impatient for answers about what happened as anyone. Um, we take very seriously the death of an American citizen under circumstances in which she never should have been killed. Um, and we are pressing to get an answer uh, but an answer that's thorough as soon as one is available. Just one uh, more on that. Um, Secretary, after her killing, called on the Israeli army to change their uh, rules of engagement. And clearly, there has been no change in this regard. Uh, you know, w what will happen? What is next? You know, will there be any consequences? I, I would direct you to the government of Israel to speak about their rules of engagement. We've made clear that this was an unacceptable incident. And it shouldn't happen again, and they should find ways to address it. But as to what they've done, um, uh, that really is a question ultimately for them. Go ahead. Thank you, Matt. Um, it, a lot of concerns of the Iranian regime desire for a total extermination of the Jewish state, and by only asking for a ceasefire, is the U.S. State Department preventing the unconditional surrender and defeat of Iran? And I have a follow-up. Um, I think we have made clear that we are committed to the defense of Israel against Iran. And if you look at the way we have backed that up, it has been through actively participating in the defense of Israel. Uh, and not just participating in the defense of Israel, but taking action to hold Iran's proxies and Iran itself accountable for its actions. And that includes more than 700 sanctions since the beginning of this administration. Okay, does the U.S. stand in way of the IDF attack on the oil and nuclear facilities of Iran? We made very clear, you heard from the president, that he did not believe um, uh, attacks on nuclear facilities or attacks on oil facilities were a wise choice uh, by the state of Israel at this time. And if you look at what could have happened from that nature of attack, it's easy to, uh, for people to sit on the sidelines and say, oh, it's a perfectly appropriate attack for the government of Israel to make, not thinking through what the consequences of such an attack would be and the fact that Iran would respond and then Israel would respond. And soon after that, we would find ourselves in a full-scale regional war, which is certainly um, not in Israel's interest or in, in the interest of anyone in the region. But just on the attacks on the oil on the reserves of Iran, wouldn't that make it more or less likely for dealing with get we, rid of their, their resources. We there. believe there is a better way to address that, which is why you saw the United States impose sanctions on Iranian oil, uh, uh, the, on the Iranian oil industry, including on its fleet of ghost ships in just the past few weeks. And with that, Sean, go ahead and then we'll wrap for today. Sure. Um, completely different region. Um, I was wondering if you had any comment on uh, Venezuela and Brazil. Uh, Venezuela has withdrawn its ambassador from Brazil because Brazil put a veto on Venezuela entering the BRICS. I realize the U.S. obviously is in the BRICS, but it's over the election and whether this was something that was discussed as a, as a pressure tactic. I will admit that I'm not tracking that development, so I'll take it back and well, get you an answer. In that region. Well, semi in that region, and so the vote happened today in the U.N. on the Cuba embargo. You know what the vote was? Yeah, it was a predictable vote in line with past votes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But just for the record, let's just say it was 187 yeah. to two, uh, one I, abstention. I, I am aware. The one abstention wasn't even a Pacific Island nation. It was Moldova. Yeah. I'm aware, of the, I'm aware of the so long you, history of UN votes on this matter. That, yes. Okay. So at what point, though, are you guys going to realize that the entire world with the exception of you and Israel, uh, thinks that the embargo is a really bad idea and should be stopped. Look, I think we are quite clear on the opinion of other countries around the world, and it's one with, so which, that, we, and it's one with which we disagree. We so, take their opinion so, seriously, so, but we make our own policy determinations. We do. It's 32 years in a row, with the exception we, of one year when you guys abstain. We, that we, look, we take their views quite seriously, but we make our own determinations I, you know about what? these matters, oh, well, and, I, and we disagree. Then, well, well, <laughs> You take their views quite seriously? I, that is just not borne out by the facts that you continue to persist with this. It's, we take them seriously, but we, we make our own decisions on the policy <clears throat> and others. So. Okay, and are you comfortable then with it's just, just once again, it's just you and Israel standing up? Certainly we would welcome other countries sharing our opinion in this, but we're not blind to the history of countries around the world having a very different view of this matter. Um, long predates this administration. Um, uh, but as I said, we make our own determinations. And with that, 
about the Obama administration? Disagreement. Were, were they wrong? Uh, I don't have anything to comment on uh, previous administration decisions. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.